Hello. So in this video, we're going to be talking about zeros, and in particular, intercepts and how they sort of work. So zeros, what are they? Well, if we have a function, like f of x is this sort of factored thing, uh, x minus 1, x plus 1, and x minus 4, all being multiplied together, there's sort of two natural things that we might want to think about, and those are x-intercepts and y-intercepts. Now, I say they are natural things we might want to think about, but why they are natural things is something that we're going to sort of get to a little bit later and expand upon in, in other sort of segments. For right now, why the intercepts? These things are actually sort of not so bad. And it's sort of important to note that I have written here, when I'm not talking about them in the general case, right, that it's a y-intercept, it's singular. And that's because there's only ever one y-intercept, or perhaps I should say at most one, assuming that one exists. That's fine print we're not going to worry about so much at the moment. But the reason for that is, remember, we're dealing with functions here, and the y-intercept is specifically where you're hitting the y-axis. So if you sort of remember from a vertical line test, right, y is a vertical line, you can only hit the curve in one spot if it's going to be a function. So you can only have one y-intercept. Likewise, sort of the x-intercepts, you can have a bunch of those because that's where it's hitting the x-axis. So here we can see we have three x-intercepts, right? Places where it's sort of hitting, going through, or even just touching that x-axis. And in contrast, as mentioned, the y-intercept, there's only one of those, right? So it's where it's hitting that particular spot on the y-axis. Now, because of the way that we have sort of written the function, we can actually write down exactly what these x-intercepts are, and we can calculate the y-intercept. So it's sort of worth a note here that there's some black magic going on about how we decided or how I decided to present the function, um, and we'll get into more of that in a second. So for the x-intercepts, we have these three different intercepts, right, corresponding to these three different points. Now, the important thing to know is that Inter intercepts themselves, these are points. They're sort of implied to be points on a graph, but they're points, meaning that they have a certain format. So when I say, you know, what are the x-intercepts of this function, if you just say, oh, they are 1, negative 1, and 4, that's not technically correct, right? Because the x-intercepts need to be points where that second value is always 0, the y value, right? So the x-intercepts are negative 1, comma 0, 1 comma 0 and 4 comma 0. Now in sort of talking informally, we sometimes gloss over that part and we just say negative 1, 1 and 4 because it's understood what we mean. But keep this in mind when it comes to actually doing stuff out like doing homework or on an exam or something like that, um, that the, the x-intercepts are points and that's important so they need to be written as points. Likewise, same with the y-intercept, right? So the y-intercept is where I'm hitting the y-axis, which I, I know I'm beating a dead horse to get this in because weirdly this is one of those things that we spend a lot of time talking about x-intercepts and people forget the y-intercept. But the nice thing is that we can calculate it. We, we just have to plug in zero into the function and see what we get. So if we do that, right, we plug in zero as that x minus one, so we get zero minus one is negative one, zero plus one is one, 0 minus 4, I get a 4. Multiply those all together, we get 4. And that's the, the y value. So our y-intercept, 0 comma 4. Okay? All right. So as promised, what do we sort of, why do we care about these things? What makes them sort of one thing more interesting than another? I mentioned that we spend a lot of time talking about x-intercepts, right? So much so that people often forget what the y-intercept even is. Um, and the reason why is that finding x-intercepts is hard. In fact, the reason they're hard is that the whole point of a function is you take in stuff and you calculate it to give out stuff, but we're trying to do that in reverse, right? We need to find some input based on what the output needs to be. So instead of sort of knowing the input and we just put it in and turn the crank until we get a number, we're doing this backwards. We have the number we want to get out and then we have to sort of figure out what the input needs to be in order to actually get that. So it's sort of fundamentally not how functions are supposed to work. So why bother, right? Like if this thing is hard, there should be a good reason for doing it. Despite what you may think, math people don't do hard things for the sake of doing hard things. We actually have some method to the madness. Granted, the madness might be deep enough that that method might be a little weird, but it's there. So 
The reason why is that it's sort of irritatingly so, these x-intercepts, they tend to actually represent really important things, right? And we said this toward the beginning where we're like, x-intercepts tend to be of interest. So why? Like, what do we mean by that? Well, think about maybe profit functions, right? If we, if we think about a profit where the output is how much we sort of made over whatever the costs were for any given sort of situation, when that thing is zero, right, when the y value is zero, that's the x-intercept, that represents one of those break-even points. That's the sort of moment where I'm finally actually sort of not losing money and hopefully I'm about to be making money. Uh, another sort of way of saying this is it's sort of that point in which you, you're in the black, right? If you're looking at money that you make over time versus costs over time, when you finally transition to getting a positive value there, right? Right as you hit that zero, that x-intercept, you're going from in the red to in the black, right? So this is sort of really important in business that when this thing happens. And sort of as a further note, depending on where you're going sort of after this, this is a pre-calculus class, um, these things are used ubiquitously in calculus and physics. And in fact, uh, one of the sort of mantra of the first semester calculus, which sort of coincides coincides to the Newtonian physics, the first semester or two of physics, is that you do some annoying things and then you set whatever you got to zero and then you find the zeros, right? So it's like almost always ends up needing to find these zeros for whatever reason. So as an example, going back to our f of x here, if we were doing this sort of in a calculus setting where we needed to like have this thing be zero and figure out where those are, and in particular, if we want to know things like where is this function positive? Where is this function negative, right? So if we, if this represented, let's say, profit, we want to know when are we making money? When are we losing money? That kind of thing. So the key here is that this thing is factored. I can separate this out using our sort of uh, zero product property, right? The fact that the product is zero means one of those things is zero and solve these things independently. This gets me the zeros of the function, which are x values, right? So that's our zeros. Not to be confused with intercepts, which are the points where these are zero, right? So they're, the zeros are, are the x values, the, the intercepts are the points on the graph. Then we can sort of draw, say, uh, a line for really any kind of numbering system, but here we're doing sort of a real line for the x values that we found. And we can test intervals of these things and find that like between negative one and one, we have a certain result, it's positive. Between one and four, we have a certain result, it's negative. If we go past four, it's positive again. If we go past negative one, like in the negative direction, it's negative. So this thing has a name, this is called a sign chart. We're gonna cover this sort of in more detail in a different sort of segment. But this is sort of one of the situations where finding these intercepts, finding these zeros is really important. And it turns out that you could sort of do a lot with a graph with this, right? So if we put these intercepts on the graph and use the fact that this thing's continuous, we can say, ah, it's gotta be positive between these two values, right? So it's gotta be positive between these two, it's gotta be negative between these two, which I know because of the, right, the negative here and the positive here, right? Positive between negative one and one, negative between one and four, that's what these things are. Likewise, positive to the right. So if I go bigger than four, it has to be positive, so it goes, up and away somewhere. And likewise, uh, the negatives, right? So if I'm to the left of negative one, it has to be negative. So it goes, say, down and away somewhere. So this is an example of where these things might come up, but they come up a lot. Uh, as, a, as a sort of further note, I will comment that uh, finding the zeros like this, this is one of those things that we actually will study sort of as we go through our individual uh, sort of function explorations, right? So there's a method to do it for polynomials. There's a method of doing it for radicals. There's a method of doing it for like exponentials and things like this. So each function sort of deep dive we do, that's when we'll figure out how to do stuff like what we did here. So don't think that you need to worry about sort of finding it explicitly at the moment other than sort of this specific kind of form where it's like, if I give you a bunch of stuff multiplied together, you set each piece equal to zero, solve them independently, and that gets you the zeros, which gets you the x-intercepts. Anything more fancy than that, and we'll talk about it in the relevant function spot.
So what do we do? Well, we talked about zeros of functions and how they sort of relate to the intercepts and specifically the x-intercepts, right? Those are the ones that are a lot of work because functions just aren't made to work that way. We didn't talk a lot about y-intercepts because y-intercepts are usually pretty easy to get, um, or should I say straightforward to get, meaning that quote unquote all you have to do is plug in zero and calculate, right? It might be an annoying calculation. I, won't, I shouldn't say it's easy, but it's, you know exactly what to do and it's very straightforward. Whereas the x-intercepts, there's a lot of techniques and stuff involved and we're gonna get into those as we go, okay? We also looked at a quick example, a sign chart. Uh, I went through it kind of quickly, but that's because we have a whole other segment on sign charts. You don't have to worry about sort of following exactly what happened there. We have a whole deep dive into just that type of thing, but it's sort of a classic example of where this comes up. Okay, so that is that.